so before we get started, I'm just going to give a little bit of background as to what we're going to be talking about today and how this um, webinar will be run. Uh, we're going to first listen to Mike run through his presentation. And while he's making his presentation, feel free to provide any comments or questions within either the Q&A or the chat. Uh, and we'll be looking to either answer them while Mike is making his presentation or at the end of his presentation, uh, we will open it up for a broader Q&A where Mike will be uh, reviewing the questions or uh, and providing answers to those questions um, after that presentation is complete. Uh, given that it is now that 633, I was just going to get started with some opening statements and then I'll turn it over to Mike at the end. So hello and welcome to tonight's presentation uh, on the presentation on the state of EVs in 2023. Uh, we've been doing this for a number of years and we'd like to keep it fresh by offering some perspective about where things stand today. Um, the City of Ottawa is hosting these Earth, event, uh, Earth Day events and to highlight the activities of energy revolution, including activities that would result in a zero emission Ottawa by 2050. Electric vehicles represent the single largest contributor to reducing community emissions and many more electric vehicles are expected to be on Ottawa's roads going forward. Federal government has also announced a zero emission vehicle mandate, which will require 20% of new vehicle sales to be electric by 2026, 60% by 2030, and 100% by 2035. The city of Ottawa has installed a number of public electric vehicle charging stations, and will be evaluating the data around that usage to support any future installations. As part of tonight's presentation, you'll have a chance to hear from Mike Banks, who is the Vice President of the Electric Vehicle Council of Ottawa. Uh, he's been a longtime uh, EV driver, starting first with a plug-in hybrid, as well as now he has a fully electric battery electric vehicle. Um, so he has experience on both ends of the spectrum. Uh, we'll be talking about both those types of vehicles today. Um, and most recently, he had uh, powered a couple of neighbors' homes out of his uh, battery electric car during a power outage, uh, keeping their food from spoiling and also helping him uh sort of show off the car in that sense uh so we're keen to listen to mike uh tonight explain both the um the state of evs in 2023 and also provide a little bit of uh context as uh, it relates to his own personal ev ownership so uh with that uh i will turn it over to mike and he can get started with his presentation thanks mitchell okay i'm just going to share my screen uh this presentation is about uh if you're new to electric cars and don't really understand um, you know, you're thinking about switching to EVs and you want to learn a bit about the terminology and stuff like that. Uh, this is the presentation for you. So I'm going to cover who EVCO is, like who are we, uh, some terminology. There's some basic terminology with EVs uh, that might be a bit different for a lot of people. Um, we're going to cover some other green technologies out there. Um, all about the battery. So I'm going to talk a lot about batteries because that's sort of the big part of the whole EV thing. Um, living with an EV, so life with an EV, I'm going to cover eight myths throughout the presentation, and then there will be a time for questions at the end. So who is Evco? Who are we? We are a nonprofit volunteer run group of EV owners. Uh, our group was founded in 1982 and originally was um, there to help each other um, convert gas cars into electric cars. Now that gas cars or now that you can buy EVs on the open market, um, the conversion projects are a bit less of what we do, and we do more um, environmental awareness and promotion of EVs um, and talks like this, where we uh, educate the public on what's coming and uh, what EVs can do and um, how awesome they are. So we're just a bunch of enthusiastic owners of EVs um, that get together and talk about cars. Um, we're also motivated by, you know, the urgent need to decarbonize the economy. Electric vehicles make up about 30% of emissions. Um, nationally, and so by decarbonizing transportation, um, that will help. So by switching, taking out that 30%, that's low-hanging fruit for us. So it's pretty easy to do. And then by doing that, there's a long tail with you know oil industry, where if you stop burning fuel at the car, then you you know you don't need to pump that oil, you don't need to move that oil, you don't need to take it out of the ground. So there's a whole chain that that EVs help with. Okay. So let's talk about some terminology. We're going to talk about watts. Hopefully everyone knows what a watt is. Um, but then there's some new things we do with watts. So there's kilowatts, kilowatt hours, kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers, that sort of thing. And then I'm going to talk about regenerative braking because that's a big part of electric cars. So what is a watt? A watt is a unit of energy or power named after James Watt. He was a Scottish inventor and chemist. Um, it's 
it's a unit of power and it's a bit less esoteric than a horsepower, right? Because like, I don't know about you, but I don't really know how powerful horses are. Like I, horses are big, scary animals. And when you say something is, you know, a horsepower, I mean, like a horse is a big animal, right? So I know from experience um, with boats that uh, like 9.9 horsepower is not that powerful, but 200 horsepower is pretty powerful, right? So we have this esoteric idea of what power is, but a, a watt sort of brings that into the metric age. Uh, so a watt is officially one joule per second, but most of us are probably, if you're over 40, you're familiar with 100 watt light bulbs. And if you're under 40, then we're going to be talking power bricks for MacBooks or other gaming laptops, so that sort of thing. Um, so 100 watts is about what a laptop power brick is, and it's also what the old school light bulbs are. So everyone sort of has this intuit intuitive understanding of what 100 watts is. And so when we talk about EVs, they need a lot of 100 watts, basically. So a 1,000 watts is a kilowatt. So that's what EVs work in is kilowatts, thousands of watts. Um, so one kilowatts, 10 100 watt light bulbs. So that sort of gives you an idea or 10 power bricks to a laptop. Um, and so 100 kilowatts is roughly 134 horsepower, which is not bad, right? Um, a thousand horsepower used to be a big number for cars. Uh, when the Bugatti Veyron came out like 15 years ago, everyone was, oh my God, it's a thousand horsepower, right? There are quite a few EVs that have 820 kilowatts, which is over a thousand horsepower now. So so there, that's that's the term we use for power, like how, you know, horsepower, like this replaces horsepower. Um, but what about storage? Like what about how much the battery contains, right? And so what we do with that is we call it kilowatt hours or watt hours, right? So for EV batteries, they're measured in kilowatt hours, which is thousands of watts per hour, basically. Um, so if you have a 100 kilowatt hour battery, um, you can drive one kilowatt for 100 hours or 100 kilowatts for one hour, right? So that's how that kind of works. Um, so once you get the handle of this, then you can easily do some mental math because it's, it's really simple arithmetic really in the end. Um, and as far as fuel economy goes, everyone's kind of used to liters per 100 kilometers. You sort of know like, oh yeah, the average car is like eight liters per 100 kilometers, something like that. Well, EVs are very similar. We use watt hours per 100 kilometers. Um, so it's the same basic idea. It's how, ma how many watt hours, how much you know, what chunk of battery is required to go hundred kilometers. And so you can do some easy mental math with that as well to figure out your range while you're driving. Um, and this is all metric, it's all divisible by 10, which is fantastic because horses, yeah, who knows? Um, okay, so now that we've sort of covered the basic terms about what we talk about as far as battery sizes and, and power of the car and, and, you know, how long, how big the battery is and how much you can get out of it. Um, we're gonna talk about, regenerative braking because that's another thing that a lot of people who are new to electric cars don't quite get and it's a bit of a concept right um so a lot of people don't know that electric motors are also electric generators right and this little gif on the side here shows you sort of how that works so when you're adding electricity to a motor when you're giving the motor electricity so think of it as like a two-sided thing right so on one side you put in electricity out the other side you get rotational movement right so motor you're moving the wheels if you already have rotational movement, you can harvest that by making electricity. And that's that's how a turbine in a hydro dam works, right? They have a big spinning turbine, right? The water goes through and makes something spin. And then you suck that energy out of it using, you know, electronicals um, to make electricity, right? And so electric motors are generators. Theoretically, you could probably take a hydro dam turbine and, you know, make water move with it. And we call that a, a boat motor, basically, on, you know, small scale. Um, electric boat motor, but I mean, it's the same device, right? So with every EV, you automatically get regenerative braking because it's the same piece of equipment. Um, and it also makes it more efficient. So what happens is when you're accelerating, you're using electricity, converting it into movement and the, you know, the car moves. And then when you start wanting to slow down, you, the, the computer in the car will start converting that kinetic energy, the rotation of the wheels into electricity and put it back in the battery pack. Now it's it's, we, we do live in the real world. It's not 100% efficient in that sense, right? There's th the laws of thermo thermodynamics still apply. Um, so it's, it's not like you can use, you know, two kilowatts to get up to speed and then harvest two kilowatts when you come back down to zero, right? There's losses along the way with friction and heat and all that stuff. But it's, it's better than nothing. It's better than what a current car, a conventional car does, which is just use friction, right? And so the brakes on your conventional cars are friction brakes, and they just 
take the energy that you took, you spent to get up to speed and they just throw it away as waste heat, right? So they just go, they just, it's, it's heat in the wheels and then it just goes, vents out to the atmosphere. Uh, so with an EV, you're actually harvesting that energy, putting it back in the battery pack. And then at very low speeds, you have friction brakes to sort of do the, finish the job, right? To bring it down to a stop. Um, but what that means is that the friction brakes on an electric car last a very long time because you're not using them constantly like you do in a normal car. You're using them very gently at low speeds. So they tend to last for years and years and years, far longer than any fossil car can do. All right, so that covers a bit of terminology to sort of get you up to speed as to sort of like, it's a lot. This, is, this presentation is gonna be a lot, but don't worry, we have questions at the end. Um, so what are other green technologies you might've heard of, right? So, I mean, everyone sort of knows about hybrids. They've been around for 25 years now. Uh, Plug-in hybrids are a bit newer on the scene. Um, hydrogen has, they've been talking about hydrogen since I was in elementary school. So it's the uh, fuel of the future forever. Um, and then we'll talk about some future technologies that might be on the horizon. So yeah, 25 years ago, hybrids were the symbol, like the symbol of being an environmentalist, right? You were not green unless you drove a Prius, right? I remember those days. Um, but since then, times have changed quite a bit. Um, so the issue is that hybrids are basically just fossil cars. They're not magical um, emissions-free vehicles. They are, they get all of their energy. Ooh, gotta go back one, sorry. Uh, they get all of their energy from gasoline, right? There's no external plug, so you can't add power any other way to the car. So anything that the car does, ultimately that energy comes from the gasoline that you put in it. Now, they do save a bit of fuel, uh, mostly in stop and go traffic. So if your daily commute is involves a lot of stop and go on the Queensway, uh, then you know a hybrid, you, you might see some savings there on fuel economy, right? Versus a, a car of similar size that's just a gas car. Um, but they won't save you much fuel on the highway. And the reason is because all of the energy that they collect from regenerative braking, right? They do have a little electric motors on them. Um, and they do the, the thing where they, they have a small battery. And so they harvest that regenerative braking and put it into the battery. And that's how they, that's the hybrid part of the hybrid vehicle. Um, excuse me. Um, but that, that's a small portion of the energy that the car is expending, right? And consuming. And so on a highway, you're not doing a lot of braking. So you're not, there's not a lot of opportunity to harvest that energy and put it into a battery and then use it later. Um, most of the batteries are extremely small. They, they give you maybe like 800 meters of all electric range kind of thing. Um, so they do, it does add up over time, but it's not really something that, you know, you'll see on your gas bill normally. Um, and sometimes it's even worse um, because it's heavier. You might, if you if your drive requires a lot of highway driving, you might actually be better off with a very fuel efficient gas car than a hybrid because there's a lot of extra weight involved uh, in the hybrid system. So your mileage may literally vary, um, but hybrids are not really um, long for this earth at this point because uh, there's better technologies. And one of those better technologies is plug-in hybrids. Now, this is my old plug-in hybrid. As Mitchell said, I used to have one. This is my car. It was a, it's a minivan, as you can see. It's a Chrysler Pacifica. Um, so they're, they're better than a normal hybrid because they have a plug. You can plug them in just like an EV. It's the same exact plug, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and so you can add energy other than gasoline to the car. It has a, a reasonably sized battery pack. It can do about 50 kilometers to a charge. Um, which is more than enough for most people most days, right? So only on the road trips do you really use the, the gas engine or when it's really cold. Um, the reason it uses the engine when it's cold is because most of the gasoline that you buy, uh, you actually throw it away as waste heat. So only 20% of the, the energy in a liter of gasoline that you purchase goes to actually moving the car forward. Everything else is either friction losses or waste heat. And 60% of it is basically waste heat. So in a plug-in hybrid, a lot of them are designed to just use the engine to make heat because why, why use your precious battery resources when you can just you know burn something to make heat? Um, so in that sense, there, that's why I got rid of mine is because I got tired of buying gasoline and oil and all of the nonsense that comes with a gas engine. Um, but they are a good fit for a lot of people um, especially if you're nervous about long range and you're not sure if there's charging up where you go um, or you need a vehicle type that isn't an EV yet. So in this case, minivans, um, there's also, you know, off-road vehicles. There are plug-in hybrid off-roaders. There are no electric off-roaders yet. Um, so there are use cases absolutely for plug-in hybrids and they are an excellent choice for a lot of people. 
What about hydrogen, though? We've heard about hydrogen for decades now, since I was a little kid, and it always seems to be 10 years away, right? It's kind of a joke that hydrogen, hydrogen's the fuel of the future. It's only 10 years away for the past 60 years. Um, and this is why, because physics, basically, is the, the short answer. Um, hydrogen is complicated. It doesn't exist in elemental form on Earth, right? So you are actually made, 60% of you is hydrogen, um, because 60% of you is water, because hydrogen on Earth tends to bind with anything. Uh, so we have hydrocarbons, that's oil. Uh, we have H2O, which is water. Um, there's some acids, right, that are out there um, that hydrogen bonds with. So hydrogen has to be created before we can use it. Um, and people call it a fuel, but it's not actually a fuel. It's just a really inefficient battery. Um, so the first thing you do is you have to create the hydrogen in order to use the hydrogen, right? So how do you do that? You use energy to, um, in this case, separate it with hydrolysis. Um, hydrolysis? Uh, they, there's a term for it, but anyway, it doesn't matter. You, you, um, you zap the water and you separate the oxygen from the hydrogen. So you collect the oxygen, you get twice as much oxygen as you do, no, nope, twice as much hydrogen as you do oxygen, right? And you can let the oxygen go in the atmosphere and that's fine. Um, and then you have to, so that takes energy, right? And then you have to compress and store it because hydrogen is very light and it likes to escape through any hole it can because it's the smallest atom. So uh, you have to compress it down, and, and usually they store it at cryogenic temperatures to pack as much into a small volume as you possibly can, which takes more energy. And now you've got this like physical good that you have to move around and do stuff with, um, which takes more energy. So you need to put it into a truck in the giant tank, right? And you got to drive the truck to where you want it, because most people probably don't want a hydrogen factory in their backyards, right? Because um, it tends to be a little explodey and a little, you know, dangerous that way. And so you, you'd have a centralized factory somewhere. And then you have to truck the hydrogen like you do with gas into a fueling station somewhere. And then you store it down underground, but there's, there's a certain amount that gets lost all the time, right? It leaks like crazy. Um, it makes metals brittle. Um, it's, it has to be kept cold um, and has to be kept sealed because it might explode. So hydrogen, that whole supply chain. And then when you need it, you go to the gas station basically and you plug in your car. Um, but because it's so cold and because you're putting it from a high pressure to a slightly lower pressure in the car, that chills it a little bit more. Uh, so then one of the issues that they always have, um, even in California, where a lot of hydrogen cars are, is the nozzle will freeze to the car, right? And it's extremely difficult to unfreeze. It takes a lot of time and energy to do that. And so I can just imagine, you know, like a, a typical gas station here in February, if it was hydrogen, you might have to leave your car at the Esso station until May, you know, so that's not ideal. And then um, once it's in the car, the car still has an electric car battery, right? There's still an EV battery in there because hydrogen isn't very good at doing um, high demand electric work. So accelerating isn't really a thing that hydrogen can do. So there's still an EV battery. There's still a lot of EV components, but then you have these two giant pressure tanks, uh, usually under the back seat where your kids are buckled up. So yeah, so there's a lot of issues with hydrogen in that department. Whereas if you look at the EV side of this, this infographic, um, you take the same power capture source, it can be wind, it can be solar, whatever, and then you just stick it right in the car, right? We already have uh, the a hydro grid everywhere where the power grid exists, has for 100 years now. Um, so we're very good at moving electricity efficiently across large large distances um, it already exists so it's and it's something you can do in your house right you can generate electricity on your roof and charge your car with it uh, so that's a much simpler chain um, and so this is why hydrogen isn't going to be a future fuel uh, so if you're waiting for your hydrogen car don't really hold your breath because yeah you might be waiting a while 10 more years at least uh, so what about other future technologies right we hear a lot about solid state batteries um, we hear about other battery chemistries. And there's, there's this fear that I hear from a lot of people. Uh, it's a fear of missing out. Like if I buy an EV today, next year, there's going to be a huge breakthrough and oh my God, my car's going to be obsolete tomorrow. And that's not good. I don't want to do that. Right. Um, well, that's not really the case. Uh, lithium ion batteries that are being used in our cars, they've been around since the mid nineties, right? So they've sort of perfected those batteries already. Uh, they're in your laptops, they're in your phones. Uh, they're in a lot of electronic devices now. And they're sort of the state of the art. And there are improvements over time, but they're, they're you know, single digit percentage improvements over time, which do add up over, you know, decades. Uh, but as far as like buying your car and then having it obsolete next year, it's not, it's not like an iPhone. Well, back when the iPhone used to do that, uh, where you'll have remorse because, oh my God, the new car is so much better. That's not going to be the case. Um, solid state batteries are a thing that might change the industry in a big way but they are many years away. They're still in the lab and 
the big problem with those right now is that they don't work below five degrees Celsius. So that's not good for automotive applications. Um, there are companies that say they have cracked that, but uh, they remain to, act to actually prove that they've done it. Um, so we'll see, that's, that's a lab thing. So yeah, don't hold your breath for that technology, but it, it is something that might come in the future, which is cool, great. Um, other chemistries that are being worked on, um, lithium iron phosphate is the big one and sodium batteries you might hear about in the news sometimes. Those chemistries are less efficient and they're less good than the lithium ion in a sense that they, they take up more space and don't give the same amount of power or energy density, um, but they are cheaper and that's why car companies are working on them. So if you buy your car today, um, even if the next car coming out is LFP, that won't make your car obsolete. What that will do is push the price of EVs down further. So they, they will put these batteries in the $10,000 EV or the $20,000 car, the cheap one with the roll up windows, right? Um, the, it won't be in the car that you're buying today. Um, the LFP batteries are, are, are very cool and they do exist in automobiles already, um, but they're mostly the low end cars. Um, so that's cool. And that's low. That's just a lower cost. And those, that's what the car companies are working on right now is to make EVs cheaper, uh, which is good. We all want that. Um, so I wouldn't worry about a fear of missing out. The changes are all incremental and they happen over years, decades even. Um, so there's no reason if there's an EV today that meets your needs, there's no reason to not buy it today is basically the take home message from this. OK, so let's talk about batteries since we've been talking a little bit about them already. So some of you have probably seen this meme. Uh, this meme came from Saskatchewan Proud, which uh, if you look into it, they were funded by the oil industry, quelle surprise. And so they're saying that this is a lithium mine for electric car batteries. Look and, and look at how horrible it is. Open pit mine, oh my God, the environmental disaster that that is, right? And then this is the tar sands or oil sands as they want us to call it in Alberta. And look at how green and lush and amazing it is. Um, well, I'm sorry to say, but this is false. Um, you can actually Google image search these images. And um, what you'll find is that the top one is actually a copper mine in Chile. And the bottom one is in fact in the oil sands or it's in the oil patch at least. Um, but what it is, it's like a fracking uh, derrick. So they drill down into the earth. So the damage doesn't happen on the surface, right? So it looks nice and lush, but under the ground, they're pumping in steam and stuff and cracking rocks and causing earthquakes and sinkholes and all sorts of nastiness. And it takes a heck of a lot of energy to do that. So it's actually way worse than it looks um, in this picture. So I'll show you some real pictures here. So that's what the tar sands actually look like. Uh, and this is a Suncor oil sand site near Fort McMurray in Alberta. Uh, so that's what the tar sands actually look like for most of the tar sands. And this is what a lithium mine looks like. So this is a Sokimich lithium mine in the Atacama Desert in Chile. And lithium is actually a salt in most cases. So it, if you see any memes out there where they're saying this is a lithium mine and it's all rocks and stuff, that's not what lithium looks like at all. It's like a salt, it's white. Um, and actually this is a lithium mine that's under construction in Ontario. Uh, near James Bay. So this is in Canada. So we actually can mine lithium in Canada as well. We have lots. Lithium is actually spread across the earth um, in pretty even distribution, right? So it's not like we'll have like lithium cartels or whatever in the future. Um, and yeah, people have accused us of being funded by the big lithium industry. And I'm like, oh, do they give out money? <laughs> because <laughs> we're a nonprofit, we could always use money. Um, but yeah, no, there's, there's no lithium cartel or big lithium industry. Um, so the way EV batteries work is, you, the, yes, you mine the materials. Mining is not great for the planet, right? That's just how it is, right? No mining is good. It's always going to damage some ecosystem in some environment somewhere, right? So mining in general isn't good, but um, like we do live in the modern world where people need cars, we need buildings, we need structures, we don't want to live in caves and use horses again, right? So that we do have to accept a certain amount of environmental impact and we have to mitigate that impact, right? Um, so how do we do that? So when you mine lithium, it lives in a car, right? You're, you're taking a metal out of the ground, you're going to put it into a car and that car is going to, is going to stay in that car for 15 to 20 years or unless there's an accident, a bit less than that. Um, but assuming the car lives its life, its expected life, it'll be 15 to 20 years, right? And then chances are the car will rust around the battery pack and the battery pack will still be good. So 
There is a second life application for batteries where they get put into a shipping container or a structure of some sort onto racks with lots of other EV batteries. And they do that job for another 20 plus years. Um, we're still in the early days of that process, but these, these facilities do exist already. And I'll show you a picture of that in a little bit. Um, and they'll do the second life application. They basically act as a generator for a building or backup, or they'll do uh, the peak shaving thing with a wind farm or a solar farm where the, the solar and wind will charge it up while they're running. And then the, the batteries will discharge the grid overnight or whatever. Um, so it'll do that job for another 20 years. And then once they're used up in that capacity after a couple of decades, they get recycled into new batteries, right? So the yields right now today by the various companies that recycle electric car batteries are 95%. And the 5% that they can't recycle are mostly the plastic clips and connectors and whatnot, because um, plastic isn't something that you can recycle very much. Um, so all of the metals in the battery, the stuff that you dug out of the ground actually gets recycled in perpetuity, just like a lot of metals we have, aluminum, steel, they're all the same kind of thing where they get recycled and recycled and you can recycle them basically forever. So this is in contrast to oil, right? Oil gets mined as well. People forget that oil has to come from somewhere. And so we dig it out of the ground um, and then we burn it, right? We don't recycle it. We don't use it. It doesn't live in a car for very long. You, you basically dig it up and then immediately burn it. And then you have to dig up more, right? Um, that is just not sustainable. So they're the, the mining right now with, with EV batteries, people like to bring it up a lot as like a, is like a thing. Well, oh, well, EVs are so clean. How come you have to mine stuff? Well, I mean, you, you mine stuff for oil too, except the oil you burn, the EV stuff gets to live forever in our industries. Um, the neat thing about recycling EV batteries is that they are already cheaper to recycle than it is to mine new stuff. The only reason they're continuing to mine new stuff is because there's not enough feedstock right now. There's not enough metal in the recycling ecosystem to meet the demand for EV batteries. So we have to mine until that's met basically. Um, but yeah, it's already cost competitive with newly mined materials, which a lot of industries can't claim. So that's kind of neat. So what does an EV battery look like? Um, so this is the anatomy of a battery pack. Um, on the left at the bottom, you'll see there are cells. Those are individual battery cells, just like a AA battery or whatever. Uh, there are different form factors. Some are cylindrical, some are square, some are you know pouches. Um, the form factor of the cell doesn't really matter. It's all the same job, basically. It just depends on what the engineers and the auto company uh, prefer as far as manufacturing and whatnot. Um, so like Tesla, for example, uses cylindrical cells. Uh, most of the legacy auto companies use the pouch cells or, or the, the packs that you see the square ones there. Um, no matter which cell design they go with, that what they do is they assemble them into modules. And those are the sort of gray rectangles. There's a couple dozen of them, or there's a dozen of them exactly, uh, sort of in that middle layer. And so those rectangles are modules. So they clump a bunch of cells together and they put them into a module. And the module will have some stuff in it, like electronics to measure how each cell is doing, um, how to charge each cell. It'll take the power from the cells and sort of combine it with the other modules um, through connectors and stuff. There's, there's also a heating uh, thermal management system. So it'll heat and cool the battery, right? Because batteries do get warm and they do like to stay cool. Uh, so there's, there's stuff in the battery pack that will heat and cool your battery, keep it nice and happy. Um, and then underneath there's underbody protection. That's an armor plate, basically stainless steel uh, designed to sort of take a hit from a rock or you know, something you might hit on the road. And then on top, there's the top of the enclosure and this weather seals the entire pack. So the pack becomes a fully watertight, waterproof enclosure um, that is designed to take a crash. It's designed, some of them are part of the car structure. Um, and so that's basically what the battery pack of an EV looks like. And that makes up the floor of the EV. So you'll recognize the previous battery pack in sort of exploded view. And now it's, you know, you put it all together and it becomes that big silver thing in between the wheels there. And so this is what a basic EV platform looks like. Uh, it's basically a skateboard. A lot of companies actually call it a skateboard. Um, and it gives you a lot of flexibility because at the front you have a motor if you want. And at the back, you can put a motor between the wheels. Um, there's no prop shaft or anything going through the middle of the car. The car's floor is usually perfectly flat. Um, you can make it as long or short as you want. You can put any type of body on top. Um, so this is what EVs look like when you take the body off the EV. This is the platform. And every company has variations of this, but they're all basically skateboards, which gives car companies a lot of flexibility. 
um, as far as designs and they can use reuse parts between models, which is really cool. So that should help with cost savings. Um, stationary storage. So this is what I was talking about earlier, where you have a rack of battery cells and the rack, um, these are all old uh, car batteries from EVs. Uh, this image is from an Eaton facility in Spain. Um, and it's, it's part of a, I think it's attached to a wind farm, right? So they use these batteries to sort of um, help with the wind farm um, act as a peaker plant, basically. So dispatchable energy. And the cool thing about stationary storage is that Unlike a diesel generator that most buildings would have, um, or a, like a peaker plant on a grid, uh, those do start up pretty quickly, but it takes, you know, in the order of seconds or even minutes sometimes, depending on the technology, right? Where you have to spool up the, the backup power in order for the backups to come on. With EV batteries or battery storage in general, um, it's measured in microseconds. So um, if you have like a server farm or something, you can't afford to have a gap in the power when the power goes off the grid. And so that's where batteries like this come in really handy for sensitive electronics and stuff where they can switch on instantaneously, basically, um, to really help uh, keep the lights on, literally. Uh, so that's what that second life looks like. And then when you go to recycling, this is what um, recycling looks like. So this, this came from uh, Redwood um, Chemical or Redwood uh, Batteries, Redwood Materials, I think they're called. Um, so it's a company, uh, they currently recycle Tesla batteries. So whenever you manufacture anything, there's always a certain percent that uh, is defective for whatever reason. And so that's currently what the battery recyclers use um, to as their feedstock, right? As their, that's what they make their business on. Um, it's all these defective batteries coming out of the production facilities. Um, so they just, you know, shred them and turn them into their elemental components and then recycle them into new batteries. And so uh, this, that's what some of the battery components look like when they've been recycled. Um, yeah, the limiting factor for these companies is feedstock. So they're just, most of the batteries made for electric cars are still in the cars they were made for, right? I have a 10 year old Nissan Leaf or 11 years old now. Uh, it still has the battery that was made for it, uh, you know, a decade and a couple of years ago for it. So most EV batteries are in the cars that they were built for. Um, so it's going to take a long time for the recyclers to actually get their hands on EV batteries. Uh, some of them do recycle batteries from like crashed cars that are written off or whatever. Um, but most of it comes from defective stuff in the supply chain as they, you know, producing these battery cells. Um, and they'll be able to scale up no problem because they're, they're itching for supply already. So living with an electric car, how do you charge it? Where do you charge it? That kind of thing. Um, so there's... A myth out there, right? Myth number three, EVs take too long to charge. We hear this all the time. Um, and I'm like, what are you talking about? It only takes 10 seconds. You just plug it in and walk away, right? Um, so most people charge at home, right? Your house is your gas station. So you, you plug in your car and then you walk away and you go to sleep or you do something else. Um, it'll charge up overnight and you wake up every morning with a full tank if you want. Um, on the highway, there's fast chargers. So these take typically between, you know, 15 and half an hour or so uh, to charge up an EV. And that's just enough time to have a lunch break or a dinner break or whatever. Um, so actually, the length of time to charge an EV isn't really an issue, um, at least not as much as most people expect. Um, so I'll go through, there's, there's three basic levels of charging. There's level one, two, and three, right? So very logical. Uh, level one usually comes with the car. That's a 120 volt um, charger and that plugs into any wall outlet. So wherever there's electricity, you can charge a car. Now it's very slow and it's not something most people do every single day, um, but it is there if you need it. And it's good as an emergency charger in your car. Or um, if you have a short commute, you can get away with just using a 120 volt, right? Because um, the difference in driving an EV versus a gas car is with a gas car, you typically buy a tank of gas, drive around for a week or whatever, do your things. And then when you run low, you go buy another tank of gas, right? With an EV, if you charge it every night on a 120 plug, um, you only need to replenish the energy you used that day. You're not doing the whole week, basically. So a lot of there are a few people I know who live with a 120, a level one outlet. Uh, one, a level one uh, EVSE and they, they just charge it every day. Right. So if they don't, they don't, their commutes like 24 kilometers or whatever, and they, you know, that takes them overnight kind of thing. And then they're back to where they started the next morning. Um, most people with an EV use a level two. Um, and that's, that's a much faster thing um, that will replenish your car overnight. No problem from basically empty to full. 
Um, so that's like an eight hour charge. Uh, so the picture in the, in the slide here is my charger at my house. Um, and that's what the charge connector looks like. So that charge connector is common to all electric cars. Um, and Tesla's have an adapter because Tesla's are unique that way. But every other car you have will have that plug. It's a J1772. But anyway, the level two is a 240 volt. Um, there's different amperages you can do for based on what your panel can handle, basically. But it, for most level twos, you'll be able to charge your vehicle overnight um, with an eight hour session. Um, so in my case, like I'm lazy, so I only charge it once a week because that's about as much as I bought fuel. Uh, so you can absolutely use it like a like you do with your gas station. Right. And then level three, I talked about that's the DC fast chargers. Those are high voltage, high power chargers. They will absolutely not let you install one of those at your house. Uh, they're expensive. There's no need for it. And hydro will definitely not put in the substation in your backyard so you can have your own level three. So don't even think about that. Those are made for highways um, and you know commercial places like that. All right, so level one and two, they use the J1772 plug, as I just mentioned. That is the standard for North America. Every EV sold and every EV charger you buy, except for the Tesla one, will have this plug. It's not, it's not gonna change, it's an, it's an SAE standard. Um, so no matter what charger you buy or what car you buy, they will all be compatible, right? And that is very important. So it's not like you'll buy a Hyundai and have a different plug from a Toyota or whatever. They all use the same standard, um, which is great. And Tesla has to support the standard. So they sell adapters and they, their car comes with an adapter for this plug for that reason. Uh, so this handles all the alternating current stuff. That's the stuff that you would do at your house. Level three is also, it's, it's also referred to as a direct current fast charger, DCFC. Um, so this actually bypasses the charger in your car and goes directly into the battery. Um, and they can do, it's the fastest way to do it. There's different grades of um, the speed and that's all dependent on your car basically. Um, but it'll charge most EVs to 80% in between 20 and 40 minutes, depending on the model of car and the charger that you're hooked into. Um, a lot of the newer ones are high power, 150 kilowatt or 350 kilowatts. Um, and so with the more of the modern cars coming out, they can take advantage of that and charge really quickly. All right. So another myth that we got is that EVs don't have enough range, right? Oh, I need that car to drive to Toronto and I, I EVs can't do that, right? Um, wrong, actually. So the top of the list there, I mean, that granted, that's an expensive car. Model S is not a cheap car. It's a $100,000 plus car. Um, but it'll do 652 kilometers to a charge, right? So that's, that's respectable. Even the Tesla Model 3, which is a lot more affordable, um, 568, right? Hyundai Ioniq 6, 581. Um, so these are all achievable cars. Even the Chevy Silverado pickup EV that's coming out, 505 kilometer range, right? And that's a pickup truck. Um, the ID4, the Chevy Bolt is actually the cheapest car on the market right now. Uh, so that's the most affordable vehicle. And it, it still does over 400 kilometers to a charge, right? So EVs absolutely have enough range for what you need them to do. Um, and they can absolutely replace a gas car on a road trip for you, if that's what you need them to do. So yes, modern EVs have range. In the early days, 10 years ago, when I, my Leaf was made, um, there were basically two EVs you could buy. You could buy the Model S or the Nissan Leaf. Um, and those were your only two options. And the Leaf was affordable and the S was not. Um, but the reason the Leaf was affordable is because it had a small battery pack of 120 kilometers on a good day. Um, those days are over. That's not the case anymore. Any modern EV you buy will have upwards of 400 kilometers of range. Um, most of them, not all, but most. And I'll get into that in a sec. All right, so not enough fast charging infrastructure. Well, this is, uh, this is the fast charge infrastructure for our area that I just took a screen cap of uh, earlier this spring. And uh, this is the non-Tesla network. So this is everything but Tesla, right? Because uh, Tesla has a really good network. Uh, it's world renowned. Um, this is the non-Tesla network. Um, and it's, you can see it's decent coverage. Um, you can basically tell where all the major highways are based on where the chargers are, right? Uh, Quebec actually has the best charging network in North America. So there you go. Uh, so there are lots of chargers and the chargers that you care about are not the ones around your house, right? Because you charge at home mostly. The chargers you care about are the ones that are three hours away, right? So that's down in the Toronto or Montreal areas. Um, so yes, charging infrastructure exists. It is getting better every single day. Uh, some of it breaks and gets repaired. You can see the wrenches. The app that this was taken from is called PlugShare. It's a crowdsourced app. So people report when a charger's down or whatever. Um, and so it's, it's the best source of information uh, for this kind of thing. 
Um, but your car also does have the chargers programmed into it and it updates usually over the air as well. So the car knows where the chargers are. You know where the chargers are. The apps know where the chargers are. Um, basically, if you run out of charge on a road trip, it's it's kind of a choice because the car will warn you that, hey, look, there's a charger over here. You're getting low. Go to the charger. Um, so you have to ignore it to you know, run out. So yeah, so that debunks that myth, I think. And then, okay, let's talk about Tesla. So Teslas have their own thing. Um, and they, they, they have their own plug because they were kind of the first to do this. Uh, so they designed a very elegant connector. Uh, it works for both AC and DC current. Um, it's proprietary. Um, actually, it was proprietary until recently where they've opened up the standard apparently. Um, but because J1772 and CCS are basically the standard for North America, um, Tesla has to support it. So they have adapters to do that. Um, so Tesla's can't natively charge at just any public charger. They have to use an adapter, but they can natively charge at any Tesla charger. Um, and so the Tesla supercharger network looks like this. Uh, so they have the same coverage. There's not as many dots, but that's because the Teslas all know where these dots are and they all are all in roughly the same places as the other networks. Um, the reason the other map had more dots is because there's more competing networks to choose from, right? Whereas Tesla is its own thing. They have a monopoly on their own connector. Uh, but they do cover the same areas, right? So you can go anywhere you can go in a Tesla, you can go in a non-Tesla, basically. All right, not enough choice. So uh, this is where I get into the EV buyer's guide. And so you'll see at the bottom end of the list, there's some older EVs with, um, that, with smaller ranges. There's actually a new Mazda with a really bad range. Um, don't get that one, I guess. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of choice. The website link is there in green. So it's evco.ca slash buyers dash guide. Um, and I try and keep this as up to date as I can. It's just a guide. It's not the gospel. So um, take it for what it is, but definitely contact dealers for like the most up to date, accurate information as far as availability and prices and stuff. Um, but this is more meant to give you a sense of what cars are available and what price ranges and what range of kilometers or battery size or whatever it is that you're interested in, whatever metrics you want to use to sort of filter cars by. Uh, this is a Google sheet, so you can sort of download it and filter it however you like. Um, but it's basically the entire list of vehicles available for sale in Canada or pre-order. And uh, you can you know, look for your next car in this list. All right. All right. So EVs are too expensive. Um, so coming this year is the Chevy Equinox EV. That's the one in the picture. Uh, that will be the most affordable EV on the market at 37.6 or 37.7, basically. Uh, the average new car sales price in Canada is actually 51,000. So there are 16 electric cars below or at that price. Um, and that's before we count the $5,000 federal rebate for a large number of those EVs, especially the more affordable ones, they get the 5,000 rebate. Um, so that's just the upfront cost, right? So there are a lot of EVs that are at or below the average cost of what a car goes for today anyway. Um, but then once you own the EV, you're looking at a savings on the fuel and energy requirements to drive it as well. So EVs cost around $2 per hundred kilometers to drive, whereas your normal gas car um, is more like 10 to $14 per hundred kilometers, right? If you're like eight liters per hundred kilometers kind of thing, um, times the price of fuel, you're looking at 10 to $14, depending on how much gas costs, right? And that's before we count maintenance, right? Where gas cars have annual oil changes and they have brakes that need to be changed and they have belts that need to be changed because they squeak or whatever. And there's filters and like transmission fluid and exhaust systems and all this stuff that exists for a fossil car doesn't exist in an EV. None of that stuff exists. Nobody's going to come buy your EV and steal your catalytic converter at night. Right. So that's, that's not a thing. So EVs as a result are much less expensive to maintain. Most of the EVs, their maintenance schedule is basically visual inspections for years before you have to actually add a fluid or something, right? Um, they just take a look at stuff and make sure everything's good. They plug in the computer and they download any codes that are on there and then say, yep, you're good to go, All right? So as a result, you'll save money on the operation as well as the purchase cost uh, in a lot of cases. All right, so one of the ones that we don't hear this as much, but it is pretty common is that EVs are slow and weak and like golf carts and they'll never measure up to my muscle car. Uh, well, the fastest or the quickest, I should say, quickest elect the quickest car in the world, the production car, is the Tesla Model S Plaid, right? Under two seconds, zero to 100. Um, the, the Porsche 918 Spider also has an electric drive, 
um, right? There's a Model S Performance up there. There's the Porsche Taycan. Those are all electric cars. Um, so there are some gas cars on this list, of course, but the EVs are beating them in a lot of ways. Um, and it's pretty telling that companies like Lamborghini and Bugatti and Porsche are starting to build EVs exclusively over to, over gas cars um, because gas cars just can't keep up with the performance. And if you're if you're buying a Lamborghini and it's slower than a, some you know electric car from Tesla, I mean that's not a good look for Lamborghini, right? People who buy Lamborghinis want their Lamborghini to be you know special. Um, so it's not really a supercar if some guy with car seats in the back can beat it on the road. Um, so that's why these guys are all switching to electric drive as well. Um, performance you have 100 percent of your torque at zero rpm all right evs don't work in the cold now we get this one a lot and um you'll notice in this picture one car is covered in snow the other car is not right and that's because the other car was plugged in overnight and had a climate timer on it which is a thing that evs can do and it cleaned itself off so i didn't have to like scrape the windshield or anything it just this is how it was when i went out to it to go to work and you just hop in and it's nice and warm inside. Um, EVs don't have um, a big gas engine that you have to wait to warm up first. They have heat pumps, right? So heat pumps give almost instantaneous heat. Whereas in a, in a normal fossil car, you have to wait for the engine to warm up before you get heat. Like everyone kind of knows that and you sort of get used to it. But once you drive an EV and realize that like there's warm air blowing out of my vents before I get to the end of the street, that's when it's like, oh yeah, no, I can't go back, right? And with preconditioning like this, right? If there's freezing rain overnight, like I don't have to scrape the windshield. It just melts itself off in the morning. Um, whereas my neighbors are all running their gas cars. You hear them idling and they're scraping away. And it's like, it sounds miserable, right? Whereas with an EV, it just, it does it. It's magic. Um, and you can idle as long as you like. So the other side of this coin is that in the summer, um, you can leave your EV running and not worry about like suffocating on carbon monoxide or anything. Uh, so if you have kids like I do, and the kids fall asleep in the back while you're out driving around and you don't want to wake them up from their nap, you can just park it in the driveway, maybe plug it in if you want, and then just like hang out and read a book on the lawn while the kids are in their little cocoon of air conditioning. And, you know, they can, they'll just sleep until they're done and then you're good to go. Right. So can't do that in a gas car, but you can absolutely do that in an EV. And one last thing is that uh, there was a, a, a story a couple of years ago about some highway traffic jam that lasted a couple of days in the US somewhere in the winter. I got a lot of people concerned about electric car owners, right? And saying, well, what do I do if I'm stuck in a traffic jam? With an EV and a heat pump, um, you can basically leave the car running for almost a week, um, heating the cabin the entire time with no emissions, right? So what you would do in such a traffic jam is just sit in your car comfortably warm and leaving it running because it'll just keep running and you're, you don't have to worry about snow piling up on the exhaust pipe and suffocating you. Um, you don't have to worry about freezing to death in your car. You can just sit in your car and wait to be rescued or whatever the case may be. Um, when you're not moving, you're not really using a lot of energy. Uh, the heat pump's very efficient that way. So most of the energy that you use in your battery is actually to make the car move. So some peripherals like heat pumps don't actually consume that much. Um, so yeah, you can just idle it for days, literally days, um, without running low. So that's pretty neat. And now it's time for questions. So I see there's a bunch of questions in the Q&A and the chat is pretty populated. So that's kind of cool. So I'll start with the Q&A. All right. How will the price of lithium impact the sale of EVs? Understand to be covered at the end. Yes. Okay. So lithium prices, it's a commodity, right? So it goes up and down um with the markets um as more supply comes online prices should go down um, but also as new chemistries are used like lithium iron phosphate they use a lot less lithium than the current lithium ion cells um, and so that should help as well so um, companies are price sensitive right companies will look to lower costs all the time and so they will they do have a, an impact on the price of evs but companies are constantly looking to lower those that bottom line and make things cheaper so hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, I'd also um, add, I, I put in a link in the chat about a recent article on CDC that shows that lithium prices have decreased from their peak of last yes. year and yep. they're down significantly. And mm -hmm. that'll likely lead to um, cheaper, either cheaper batteries or cheaper vehicles moving forward. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah, with the new chemistries as well. 
Okay, thinking of buying a used leaf, it's within your budget and is big enough for your needs. What about Chatamo plugs? Yeah, so yeah, Chatamo is a deprecated standard is what we're calling it, um, where it is supported for now, um, but it, I wouldn't count on it being supported much past the end of this decade. Um, typically, nobody's putting in new Chatamo plugs and the ones that are there are being maintained for now, but there will come a time where the various charging companies will stop supporting those plugs uh, and you will be left with an orphaned car basically uh, so if the leaf does your job the leaf is actually it's more suited for a city commuter than anything else um, so it's it's better suited for that so it's not really a road trip car so it shouldn't be a big issue but um yeah i would i would be concerned about that um, the leaf is a hard use case if you're using it for something other than a commuting car um, and so if if you have like a 25 or 50 kilometer commute every day the leaf will be plenty for that. Um, and if you have to do a road trip once in a while, you may consider renting something at that point. Um, so it should be fine. I mean, the leaf is very reliable. I have one, it's 11 years old and it's perfectly fine for grocery getting and commuting and stuff. But the Chatamo thing, yeah, I, I, I don't use the Chatamo for that reason. Cause like it has it, I just don't road trip the car cause it's not really suited for that. Hopefully that helps. How do I convince the condo board not to charge me a flat rate for electricity? Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't know if I have an answer to that. <laughs> I wish I did. Um, condo boards tend to be a sort of in a world of their own. And uh, yeah, it's, yeah, I I'm, reach out to us after the talk, um, evco.ca. So info at evco.ca. Um, we might be able to help. We do have some experience in talking with condo boards, but uh, you're looking at an uphill battle, basically, in that. Um, Mike, I just had another yeah. clarifying question maybe you could add. Um, in terms of EVCO, uh, do you work exclusively in Ottawa, or are you associated with any other electric vehicle associations across Canada? Or um... <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm just with EVCO. Um, I live in Ottawa. My I have a day job that's not this. Um, <laughs> I work for the government normally. So this is just a volunteer thing I do. This is just um, like, I'm not paid to do this or anything. I just do this because I care about climate change and I want everyone to switch to electric as quickly as we possibly can because the days are numbered for us, right? So we gotta get, we gotta get the show on the road kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my story. Um, how does the insurance industry on this one? So the costs are basically the same. When we switched from gas to electric, it was, I, we, I don't, I think our insurance actually went down a little bit. Um, so yeah, the insurance industry is fine on this. EVs have been around for a decade now, so they're not exactly new. Um, so they're not something that the insurance industries aren't familiar with insuring. So they're, yeah, you shouldn't, you shouldn't see it much of a change unless you're going from like a, like a 20 year old Honda Civic to like a, a brand new Tesla or something, then your insurance will go up because it's like a new car. But um, yeah, there's no real difference in that department. Which EVs would be suitable for commuting 90 kilometer round trip? Um, if you're talking used, um, I would suggest looking at like a Kona or a Nero, something like that. Uh, maybe a Soul. I'm not sure about the Soul, but there are some cars um, that can do that. I wouldn't count on an older Leaf to be able to do that because uh, that's sort of the upper envelope of what a Leaf could do when it was new. Um, but yeah, the Konas and the Neros would probably be your best bet. The problem with the Leaf is that the battery degrades quickly over time because in those cars, they didn't put the thermal management stuff I talked about earlier. Uh, literally every other EV has that except the Leaf uh, for whatever reason, probably cost cutting 12 years ago. Um, and so as a result, the batteries get a little hot and they cook and that's not good for them. Um, whereas every other EV manages that problem so that they don't cook and then they, they live a lot longer, like very much longer than a leaf so that's why i would say maybe not get a leaf for that job but like a bolt would be good too a chevy bolt um so there are a few cars that you could look at uh am i here i'm hearing that winter arriving. yes okay so that is a more complicated question than you might expect um the short answer is it depends uh which is the best kind of answer um basically if you cold soak a car, like if you leave your car parked in the forest and walk away and it's minus 30 for a week and come back, yes, you will have a huge uh, hit on your range up to like 40% or something, right? 
Um, but for most people, that's not really how you use your car. Um, so it's all about managing the heat. So when you charge your car, that warms up the battery pack a little bit, right? Um, you can precondition the car while it's sitting in your driveway, which warms up the battery pack a little bit. Um, if you start driving the car, that also warms up the battery. Um, and so that will actually reduce the impact that the cold has on your battery pack, um, especially if you're doing something like a road trip. So like in the winter, um, your first leg of your road trip might be a bit shorter than the, it would be in the summer months. But once that pack is warmed up because you've driven it and you've charged it, you know, on a fast charger, uh, you should approach more normal ranges again. Um, and the heat pumps have done a lot to um, reduce the impact of winter has on the car. Um, in the olden days, like with my leaf, my 10 year old, 11 year old leaf, uh, it has a resistive heater, which is extremely inefficient, right? Like it's basically like a toaster running like a, you know, like one of those space heaters. Um, and so that just eats the battery alive, right? But with the heat pumps, they're a lot more efficient. And so you can get more heat for less energy, uh, which means more range, basically. Um, and so all the new EVs have heat pumps, essentially. Um, so the winter range, you're looking at realistically maybe 20% or 10, even depending on if you have a garage or not. Um, but it's really not that bad. So if you have like a, like in my case, I have an Ionic 5 as our main car. Um, and that car... In the summer, I get 500 kilometers of range. In the winter, I get four, right? So that's about 20%, um, which isn't bad, right? Like that's totally enough to do a road trip. Uh, it just means an extra charging stop maybe uh, on the way. Um, Raymond's just answering something with Avec. Yeah, so yeah, we do work with them, but I'm not part of them. Uh, what about resale value? Previously had a hybrid and the depreciation was three times that of normal ice. Yeah. Um, if you actually look at EV resale value on Auto Trader, um, most of them hold their value quite well, um, like extremely well, annoyingly well, even if you're looking to buy one. Um, so, yeah, it depends. Like the leaf depreciates hard because of the battery thing, um, but that's pretty much the only one that depreciates really badly. Everything else, like especially Teslas, they hold their value like crazy. I don't know why, but. Um, EVs are in high demand. And so whenever something's in high demand, if there's a limited supply, right, price goes up. And I'm based on some numbers I've been playing with for the past six years. Um, I would bet money that um, the gas cars will start depreciating very savagely over the next five years uh, compared to electric cars, just because the market's going to do a big shift over to electric. And at some point there will come a time where you won't even be able to give away a gas car because nobody will want it because it's such a hassle, right? Uh, so yeah, hopefully that answers that question. And then, yeah, I don't need to answer Raymond's. Uh, is there anything in the chat? Um, I think the only questions that were still outstanding were maybe from Gord. I think we saw one come through around uh, when it, when you were listing those range figures on the vehicles. Sure. Um, the vehicles themselves are slightly heavier uh, when it comes to EVs compared to um, gasoline vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, the numbers that are expressed there, are they um, reflective of uh, real world use or are they reflective of um, the traditional uh, EPA rating standards that apply? Um, okay, so there are two EPA standards that car companies can opt to use, one of two. Um, and one of them is pessimistic and one of them is optimistic, essentially. Uh, so some companies opt for the pessimistic one. So Hyundai Kia, I know this from experience, right? The Hyundai Kia cars actually outperform whatever the range figure is officially um, because they decided to go with the pessimistic one and do sort of like worst case scenario ranges. Uh, so if the published numbers for a Hyundai or a Kia uh, that you see, uh, chances are you'll get better than that. Um, some other companies, I think Tesla is one of them, although I think they might have switched to the new, the other standard. Um, but historically, like Tes Tesla and Nissan were on the, uh, the other choice where they would report their range kind of optimistically. So it's like you could achieve it in perfect conditions, but chances are you won't. Um, so I guess my answer to court is it depends, <laughs> but um, for the most part, they're fairly accurate. Um, the car companies know what they're doing. The engineers are sort of on the ball and they, they wouldn't get away with um, just bald face lying about the range numbers. So if you see a range number um, sort of reported by um, industry, is it Industry Canada or NRCAN? Uh, NRCAN does the reporting. It's NRCAN again. does the reporting. Yeah. So if you see an NRCAN number published, then chances are the car you're looking at will probably get around that. 
It might not be precise, of course, because real world, but um, it shouldn't be too far off the mark. Um, yeah, it is, I would say that the um, the numbers you see that are listed on the Anarchan website represent um, sort of a based on highway and city driving. Yes, so it's a blend. city driving, you will experience more range than what's quoted. Mm -hmm. If you were doing more highway driving, you might experience less. And the other thing is that those numbers also represent um, sort of your average day to day. Although in summer or, or in the temp, like when you're sort of in the range of the 10 to 20 degree uh, ambient temperature outside, your your battery range is going to be optimized in those conditions uh, mm -hmm. and less so during the winter months and slightly less so in the summer months, um, generally because uh, heating your vehicle is more uh, energy, cons it consumes more energy to heat than it does to cool your car. Um, and therefore, you'll see a greater range uh, drop in winter than compared to summer. Yeah. And the other thing I should point out is um, just as an EV owner, if you want hypermiling tips, the best speed to go is 50 kilometers an hour for pretty much all the cars. Um, so if you want to maximize range, uh, drive at 50 and your range will be ridiculous. Like it'll be amazing. Um, but I mean, that's not always practical to do, um, but 50 is the sweet spot. So that's where they sort of get the mess bang for the energy buck. Uh, we um, saw a great, uh, I had a great question that came through in the uh, chat there around um, maybe standard. we've listed a whole bunch of great positives, but are there any surprises or any potential negatives that you had when you made the switch to your EV or your you made you switch from your plug-in hybrid to your battery electric car? Honestly, like I... <laughs> No, not really. Like, um, like our hydro bill didn't really go up appreciably. Like we didn't notice we were looking for our hydro bill to go up because we assumed like, you know, you're spending a hundred bucks a week on gas or whatever. Um, it must go somewhere when you switch to EV, but because EVs are so much more efficient and use so little energy relative to what a gas tank contains, um, that, yeah, we didn't really notice our hydro bill go up. Um, but as far as like negatives, um, I had to buy a new jack to change my own tires. Like the tires are enormous now, but I think that's just a new car thing. They're all 20 inch and heavy. Um, so I had to get a new jack for that. But other than that, like the, the, the plus sides outweigh the downsides by a huge margin, right? Like, I don't want to sound like a fanboy for EVs, but I literally am, right? <laughs> like, like, it's just like, I, I will never go back to a gas car because gas cars are so inconvenient and just, yeah, not interested in it. Um, standard transmission. I see David's question a couple times there. That's a great question. And I came from a standard. I used to have a golf, right? Like a Volkswagen golf with a stick. And I was like diehard standard transmission, right? It's like the ultimate anti-theft device. Most people my age don't even know how to drive stick. Um, so I like, this is great. Right. Um, but the reason I, when I switched to EVs, right, EVs don't have transmissions. Like there's no gears. There's one gear. It's a reduction gear. You don't change gears uh, while you're driving. Um, so there's no need for a, like a stick or even like, like a, one of those, uh, like the automatics with the, 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 the skidoo type automatic that some cars have now, which I hate, but um, the reason I, it occurred to me, the reason I liked the, the manual transmission was because it allowed me to sort of get the torque when I needed it. Right. If you want to pass somebody, you pop it down a gear and hammer it. Right. And that's the joy of having the, the standard transmission is being able to sort of have the power on tap when you want it. With an EV, because of the way electric motors work, you always have that power on tap at any speed, any time. So you don't have to downshift or anything. You just put your foot down and it goes like a rocket. So I find myself not missing having to switch gears or anything. Like I, like it's just not something that I think about anymore. Um, so yeah yeah and the other thing um on maybe not specifically related to how you drive the car with a transmission but uh, a lot of vehicles now have one pedal drive which has the same kind yes. of playfulness i would say when it comes to how you accelerate brake and basically exist in traffic um the one problem i had when having a manual transmission was the constant stop and start within say stop and go traffic mm, yeah uh, that's true. i will never never go back to that just simply because of the annoyance that i had yeah. um, but the one pedal drive really does uh you don't have to move from the accelerator to the brake back and forth um you can let off on the accelerator gently and accelerate within traffic and you don't really have to move your feet as much in order to uh, yeah. stay up with the flow of traffic 
Absolutely. Okay. Has there been any government discussion on raising annual registration rates to offset taxes lost at the gas pump? Uh, not yet. Uh, EVs don't make up a huge percentage of the cars on the road at the moment. Um, but have no fear that if the government misses that revenue, they will absolutely raise it somehow, uh, some other way. Um, a common misconception is that the gas tax pays for our roads. It does not. Um, and it is, it is, uh, it's actually extra money, basically. It's non-recurring revenue that they see. So um, part of the LRT in Ottawa, for example, was paid through some gas tax revenue from the province. Uh, so the, the, what they do with the gas tax money is they typically add it to projects like public transit projects as a lump sum amount. So here you go. Here's some money from the gas tax to build the thing you're building or whatever. Uh, so it's not something that keeps a program running all the time. Um, so it's kind of extra in that sense. But if they miss it, they will figure out a way to tax you on it. Um, and, and don't forget, like EV drivers do pay. Well, we used to until Ford took away the licensing fee, but we did pay the same license plate fees as everyone else. Um, and you do pay tax on your hydro, right? So that is still a thing. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, I think that's that. Uh, can we expect the price of EVs to drop when the battery factory opens in Ontario? Um, that will mostly help with supply and demand. I don't, EV prices will probably drop when the Chinese enter our market. That's the short story of it. Uh, right now, most of the car makers are focusing on the high-end vehicles because that's where uh, their bottom line sort of lines up with the profit margins they want. And there's so much demand even at that part of the market that they're having trouble meeting them. Like if you try and go buy an EV right now, you're looking at probably a year wait, right? Um, and that's because there's so much demand, even at the prices we have today. Uh, so going down market will probably take uh, somebody like BYD or NEO or somebody to come into our market uh, with a cheap Chinese built EV. Um, and then that will start the competition there. Hopefully that'll be within the next five years. Uh, I know BYD is making some pretty cool stuff and some other companies in China are as well. Um, um, they're entering the European market as we speak, and they've already hit the Australian and New Zealand markets. Uh, so it's only a matter of time before we see lower priced electric cars come here. Um, Mike, I had a question come through in the chat as well sure. um, around any vehicles that you know of that are available for test drive at dealerships. Uh, I don't know of any at dealerships, um, but we do have the EV experience. So if you go to evexperience.ca, we offer free electric test drives. Um, we have events throughout all the whole summer. We're nailing down some more events right now. So there's nothing really on the calendar yet, but keep looking at that website and we will have events for test drives. Uh, Raymond just put it in the chat there. Thanks, Raymond. Um, and so, and Mitchell with a hyperlink, which is more useful. Um, so... Yeah, so uh, come to one of our events. We have a whole bunch of members with different cars. Um, they're not all Teslas. We have an ID4. We have uh, my Ionic 5. Um, there's Model 3s and Ys. Um, we have like a whole bunch of cars, a Nero. Um, there's just like a bunch of cars. So you, you can sort of shop around even if you like. Um, and yeah, and Tesla. The other, the other thing to mention is that um, there's any dealership that has a used EV on their lot is likely available to test drive as well. That is true. Um, yep. And there are, there are EV specific brands like, like Mike was mentioning with either Tesla or Polestar is another one. Mm -hmm. um, they seem to have more availability on test drives um, just based on the fact that that's the vehicles they sell and they likely have one that's yes. available to specifically for test drives. And apparently Hyundai has a system you can sign up on their website. I don't know the name of it. You'd have to Google it, but it's a, it's a clever name. I liked it. Um, where they let you test drive a Hyundai car, but it's, I think it's through Turo, but they have a whole thing set up. So if you go to their website, I'm sure you'll see the links for test driving in there. Um, so hopefully that answers that. But yeah, come to EV Experience, one of our events, and you can test drive as well. Um, does the increased torque mean you go through tires more quickly? Kinda. <laughs> um, it, the torque is, uh, it depends on how you use the torque, right? If you drive normally, um, which is a little challenging to do sometimes because it's just so much fun, uh, then you shouldn't go through tires any faster than any other car. Um, but as with all power comes, you know, great power comes great responsibility. Um, 
and it is really fun doing the zero to 104 seconds sometimes and that will definitely go through your tires faster so it, it's basically up to you peter <laughs> if you if you wanted to burn through tires you can absolutely go through tires quickly um but you don't have to it's it, the tires are normal um car tire stuff they're you know they're weighted they're rated for the weight of your vehicle right so um you should be fine and they should last you like a good five years or whatever um maybe less but yeah they shouldn't be too different than your what you're used to uh can you talk about installing a charger which level at one's residence the logical issue logistical issues to consider do most EV owners have a charging station installed at home do they simply rely on charging stations elsewhere okay that's a great question um so installing a charger at your house isn't that complicated. Um, basically, you can buy a charger from anywhere from three hundred to a couple thousand dollars, depending on what you want. At the end of the day, any charger you buy is basically the same. So um, the one that we always sort of recommend is the Grizzly. It's a Grizzle Dash E. Um, it's Canadian built. It's five hundred bucks, which is on the low end of the spectrum. Uh, it's solid as a rock. Uh, it's made out of metal. It's easy to install. It's just like a really good charger, and they're very reliable. Um, cause basically all they are is just a fancy switch, right? Like there's no actual like intelligence necessarily in the charger you buy. It's more, um, just a mechanism that says, okay, yes, let the power flow to the car, right? The charger itself is actually built into the car. Um, so the car does all the heavy work. Uh, the thing on the wall is just like a, a safety thing basically to plug it in. Um, so running the, uh, the cost will vary basically on your house depends on where your panel is and where your charger is and how far apart they are because the most expensive component other than the charger itself um, is the wire it's like a big gauge wire to go from your panel to the charger and so that will probably be the biggest determining factors of the cost on average you're looking around two thousand dollars plus or minus two thousand dollars kind of thing <laughs> so it really depends on your specific situation um, most EV, EV owners probably do. If you have off-street parking, then a charging station is probably the best thing. Uh, it's just so much more convenient. And I mean, you're buying a, a car that's worth, you know, $40,000, $50,000. What's another couple thousand to get your home gas station basically installed, right? So um, most people tend to have a charger because it unlocks all those cool things about the preconditioning and all that stuff that you can do with your EV. Um, and so, yeah, it just makes it way more convenient, but you can absolutely use an EV like um, a gas car where you go to a charging station and fill it up. I know one of our members did that because he, he's an electrician and he's just too lazy to install his own charger. So <laughs> he got his EV and then I think he's, I don't think he's installed his charger yet. So he's still doing the whole driving to the fast charger once a week to fill up every, you know, every week kind of thing. Um, so you can absolutely do that if you want. It's just a lot cheaper to have your own charging station at home because level twos are much cheaper than level three uh, to use. Yeah, and, I, and the only other thing I would add on that is um, in the early days when I was using my plug-in hybrid, um, I actually lived off a, a level one charger for the first mm -hmm. two years um, yeah. because of the, the nature of what I was using my car for, which was to get to and from work, which is generally only a 50 kilometer round trip. Um, if you leave your car charging overnight, you'll be able to recoup that 50 kilometers of range, no problem. Uh, and it, and if you don't have, say, a 200 amp service, or um, you're not you know, you're not looking to put in a massive line of electrical cable to your garage, and it might be more costly, um, it, it might work out that you could uh, get by with just a level one. And then any time that you needed a um, a top up, you could visit any of the public charging stations and uh, yeah charge if needed yeah and that's true and there are some free level twos around town as well that i shouldn't i shouldn't forget to mention uh so like if you go to ikea for example um they have free charging um i think bayshore mall like there's some malls so if you're strategic about it and you sort of go to the same places all the time and some of them have free chargers uh then that's another way to do it so you don't actually need a charger or if your work has a charger that you can use uh, that works too uh, so there's definitely ways uh without having to install your own charger at home uh, specific question about best EV to buy for your situation. Uh, you can just email me, mike.banks at evco.ca. I can put that in the chat. Yeah, I mean, everybody's uh, got it their own opinion of which car is best for you. Uh, really, it comes down to which vehicle you think is best for you. Um, yeah. You do with all the different uh, makes and models are available, which ones we would recommend you look at. 
Um, but when it comes to which one you should get for yourself, uh, we, we would like to leave that up to you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can definitely point you in some directions about what might work best for you. Um, but ultimately, yeah, it'll be up to you to figure out um, what will work best because everyone has their own needs, right? Everyone wants like a hatchback or a sedan or a Jeep or whatever. So, I mean, we can talk, we can just send me an email. Um, the email's in the chat and uh, you can, yeah, I'll answer. And we have the buyer's guide, so you can sort of go through that and check it out as well. Um, have I heard any stats on roadkill due to silence of EVs? Ah, that's a great question. I do not know of any stats on uh, roadkill from EVs because over 30 kilometers an hour, every car makes the same noise, like same amount of noise. That's just fix it, physics, right? So uh, friction uh, of the road tires on the road, there's air resistance. Uh, so EVs make the same noise as any other car at speed. So on the highway, um, there's no reason to expect... Um, animals to be you know duped into thinking there's nothing coming because the car will still make noise the tires are still making noise on the road um, and if you hear if you're you know go hang out next to the queensway or something one day you'll see evs go by and they still make the same noise as every other car where evs are quiet um, on almost silent is at low speed under 30 kilometers an hour um, and in that case i would argue that if you're hitting deer at 30 kilometers an hour or slower then it's kind of on you to not hit stuff because that's very slow right like 30 30 kilometers an hour is kind of jogging speed maybe almost but i mean it's not jogging speed but it's it's you know it's slow enough that you should have situational awareness to not run over people or animals right um so yeah um why should i try to sell my 2013 elantra for an ev when there are none available um there are EVs available, new, um, but a lot of them have wait lists. That's true. Uh, there are used EVs available for sure. Uh, so you can just go on Auto Trader and filter for fuel type as electric, and you will see there's a ton of EVs. Most of them are Leafs, um, which you, you you know depending on your use case could work. Um, but there are some excellent EVs on there as well, like Konas and Neros and stuff like that, um, and Bolts. And uh, I think that's most of them because those are the sort of the older version, older fleet of EVs that came out. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a ton of used cars on the market as well. Um, especially if you're willing to drive a little bit like to Toronto or Montreal, then there's even more. Um, but yeah. And the other thing on that as well is um, even though some brands have long wait lists, there are other brands that don't have nearly that same wait. Um, That's true. Like Polestar. Automakers that have been making EVs for a long time or, or only make EVs um, have a sort of a a propensity to have more EVs available that you could get on a sooner time frame. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Some companies have more supply than others for sure. Um, is there a charge at charging stations? If so, what does it cost? It depends on the station. Uh, so generally what you'll find is that the level twos are either free or very cheap, like a couple bucks an hour or a couple bucks a session, that kind of thing. Um, and the reason is because those are those are long term charges. Those are the kind of charges you'd use overnight. So like at a motel, for example, you'd roll up and charge overnight. Um, and so they typically don't charge you. It's just sort of a perk of going to that facility. Um, the fast chargers have varying costs. Um, they usually charge right now, um, but that's this is changing in the future like this year. But for now, they charge based on time. So they'll have a certain cost per hour. Um, and now it does seem like pretty expensive, like sometimes it's like 30 bucks an hour or something, right? But uh, keep in mind that most cars charge in less than an hour, like you're, you're there for half that or, or even less, like 15 minutes uh, sometimes, depending on your car. And so um, the typical charge stop, from my experience, runs around 10 to $15 a stop kind of thing. Um, but I mean, your mileage may vary. Uh, typically, what you would do at a fast charger is you only charge to 80%. And that's just to save time because it takes the same amount of time to go from 10% to 80 as it does to go from 80 to 100. So what you do is you charge to 80 and then move to the next charger three hours away and then rinse and repeat. That way you're not wasting time getting like 10% more charge or 20% more charge in your battery. Um, and that'll save you money too. Uh, but yes, the fast chargers do cost money uh, and they should because it's not cheap to put them in and they need to have a business model that works. Um, and we want to discourage people from just like parking and walking away, right? And leaving a charger unoccupied, but not charging, which is the worst. Uh, so that's definitely a thing. Do you feel that the technology is solidifying enough 
that you should consider holding onto one vehicle long-term rather than trading in. Yep, absolutely. It already is. Um, I fully expect to have my Ionic 5 until I retire. Um, EVs are super reliable and they're at the point now where they have long range, they, they are durable. Um, they should not break down as easily as an old gas car because they just don't have the components that typically fail, right? They're mechanically simpler and therefore they should be more reliable. Um, and I mean, I'll replace my Leaf at some point because the Leaf is 11 years old and it's a first generation electric car. And so it has a lot of you know first generation of anything issues. Um, and that will be replaced with a long range EV at some point, but for now it does the job I need it to do. And, um, yeah, my Ionic five, I fully expect to keep for like 20 years at least. Um, so yeah, uh, EV technology is mature. It's been around for a decade already, even more. And, uh, yeah, you can definitely hold on to one for long term. Yeah. And I, and maybe on that one, the only other thing I would add is um, gasoline cars are only getting more complicated given mm -hmm. that they have to meet strict emission re reduction uh, targets based on um, basically the U.S.'s CAFE standards around emissions. Yeah. Um, so there's more and more things that can go wrong on a gasoline car because of the number of things they continue to add to improve a fuel economy. Um, battery technology and the battery cells have a longer warranty than most um, components within a gas car and if anything does fail under warranty and gets replaced you get the balance of that warranty added on so you get a whole new warranty for any um, components that get replaced in that warranty period yeah um, so like in, in there was a manufacturing defect with chevy bolts a few years ago uh that required chevy to replace all the battery packs in those cars because they had an issue with uh, one of the suppliers and so when they did that under warranty right everyone's everyone got new battery packs that were more they had more capacity than the original so they could go farther with this new pack and it reset the warranty clock back to zero so they had another eight years from whatever that date was when they got their new pack installed so um the warranty was better than good right it was reset to day one again and so they had another eight years one hundred sixty thousand kilometers on whatever the car had already had um so yeah that's yeah evs are pretty good that way um, progress being made on Canada to allow billing energy. Yes. So that has already passed actually. So that is coming. It's up to the individual charging companies to actually adopt it and implement it. I know a couple of them have already. Tesla is, Tesla has applied. I don't know if they've implemented it yet. I don't think so. Um, but there is another company that actually was the first to implement it. I think it was ChargePoint or somebody, um, that they've actually started rolling that out charged by kilowatt hour rather than time. Um, but that, that was a, uh, something that just went through last, uh, just at the end of the last year, actually. Uh, so that look for that in the coming year, basically to happen for everyone, hopefully. And, uh, I put into the chat, the article that sort of summarizes what, um, per kilowatt hour billing means as well as, um, what that, uh, could look like in an implementation perspective. There you um, go. Yep. which I think lends us into the final question that I see in the Q&A from Raymond around how uh, idle, idle charges, charges work. Yeah, so. so those 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 are there to um, make you move on from a charger, right? So the worst thing that you can do as an EV owner and driver is to camp at a charger with a car that is plugged into a charger, but not charging because a lot of times the, the plug actually gets uh, like locked into the car and nobody else can unplug it even when the car is done charging. And that is super frustrating because if somebody rolls up needing a charge and your car is sitting there for eight hours plugged in, but not doing anything, um, that's not very nice to other EV drivers, right? So a lot of charging networks have implemented an idle charge where they basically charge you by the minute. It's like, it's not cheap either, right? Um, and they will ding you quite a bit. So the longer you camp, the more expensive it gets. Um, yeah. EV versus hybrid now. I'll take one last question because we have like five minutes left. Um, definitely EV. Um, you could you could make an argument for plug-in hybrid, um, but I wouldn't go normal hybrid. Like Prius hybrid, no. Unless it's a prime where you can plug it in. Um, normal hybrids don't really give you many advantages. They typically cost more than the just plain gas version of that vehicle. And you will never see the savings, essentially, if you live anywhere and commute anywhere where there's highway driving involved. Um, so yeah, I would definitely go EV. Uh, EVs are like modern EVs right now are perfect gas replacements. You know, like they have the same 
range as your typical gas car. They're cheaper to run. They're cheaper to own. Um, they cost on average, the average sale price of a new car in Canada anyway. So they're not more expensive than a similar gas car with similar features and whatnot. Um, and yeah, cost of ownership calculator. Thanks, Mitchell. Uh, so yeah, definitely EV over hybrid any day of the week because a hybrid still has gas, right? So it still has all the the oil changes and you have to buy gas at a gas station and smelly and inconvenient and all that fun stuff. Yeah, the, the reason I put the cost of ownership calculator in there is that you can look at it and compare how you're, um, you're if you're comparing two different vehicles, I like to compare the F-150 because it has a gas version, a hybrid version and an electric version. Um, and you can adjust how often you drive and how far you drive. Um, and it really tells you which kind of vehicle is the cheapest to operate, uh, at least to, for those five years of ownership that it looks at. Um, mm -hmm. and for the most part, it comes out on top that EVs are generally cheaper than any of the other vehicle options within each category. Mm -hmm. um, so, <laughs> I, and it's then CAA runs it on an impartial basis. They're not trying to sell you cars. They really just want to keep whatever car you get uh, operating as long as possible. So, um, I, I put that in as just sort of a, a way that you can look through what uh, a third party who's completely impartial would offer you as a uh, when it comes to um, cost of ownership. Yeah, and the Two Degree Institute um, did a study a few years ago where they compared a gas car and then an EV version of that same car. Um, but they did a ten-year comparison, and in both cases, they used two different ver like two different vehicles with a gas and electric version each. Um, and on those two examples, um, over ten years, they saved about twenty grand per vehicle, like per EV, over the gas version of the same car, even though the EV costs more to buy up front. Um, so. Yeah, you will definitely save money with an EV over a gas. And uh, we should also mention that all vehicle, all new vehicles, or not all new electric vehicles, sorry. Um, some electric vehicles in Canada qualify for a $5,000 rebate. So you can get uh, some vehicles a little bit cheaper than what you see as their advertised uh, sale price. So um, you can check that out online as well. Uh, CAA has the full list of cars that are eligible there as well. Um, yeah, uh, everybody seems to love the commentary that we've provided, so that's great to hear. Um, that's good. Like we've uh, like we've mentioned before, the recording of this should be available to use uh, sometime next week. We'll mail that out to everybody who is on the participant list. Um, and if there are any other questions, you can follow up with us afterwards, um, either on our City of Ottawa webpage. Um, you can subscribe to our newsletter to keep informed of whatever uh, new events we have coming up. Uh, and then also check out EFCO's website if you have any specific questions about uh, re anything related to electric vehicles in Ottawa. Uh, and Emma's put that climate change newsletter in the chat there. So if you have any additional uh, interests related to anything related to redu emission reductions in Ottawa, feel free to subscribe there and learn more about them. Uh, I think that was everything we had today. So uh, we'll be ending the recording and hopefully you guys have a great rest of your evening. Thanks a lot, Mitchell. Great.